Aloha class, here's the agenda that's going to get us to modeling the respiratory system. So far, we've been building the big picture around metabolism. Metabolism produces energy in the form of ATP to drive the processes of life, whether it's generating chemical gradients or driving synthesis or growth or carrying out muscular work. Metabolism generates heat, and we've studied how animals with their energy budgets must shed heat to remain in heat balance. We've also studied how much food is required to fuel metabolism. And all of these processes are stoichiometric. So if we know the animal's DMR or RMR, we can know exactly how much O2 is consumed via respiration which matches how much CO2 is produced. We've also just learned about the Bohr effect and how CO2 is important in acid-base balance and determining hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. No matter what kind of respiratory system you have, there are two physical processes involved in ventilation and circulation. And here, by ventilation, we mean breathing or getting air or water next to the gill or lung surface. And by circulation, we mean moving blood, in this case carrying oxygen, around the body. And these two processes are bulk flow, aka convection, which moves oxygen via flow of the media that it's dissolved in, whether it's air, water, or blood, and our old friend diffusion, which is movement of oxygen by random motions or Brownian motion. In respiration, this movement is across the respiratory membrane. Remember that diffusion is slow over long distances, but it can be really fast over tiny distances, like the space between the alveoli and the capillary. The lungs expand, generating negative intrapulmonary pressure, which sucks air into the lungs by convection. Inside the alveoli, the oxygen diffuses into the blood capillary, where it gets taken up by the hemoglobin. The heart then pumps the blood around the body, again by convection, so that the blood picks up O2 in the lungs and delivers it to the tissues, where it enters the cells via diffusion where it's being consumed in the mitochondria. All of this movement of O2 is passive. The oxygen cascade is driven by favorable oxygen gradients. The respiratory system is brilliantly designed to maintain these gradients all along the way so that oxygen is delivered in the right direction. Notice the high carbon dioxide at the tissues which drives the oxygen off the hemoglobin dumping oxygen at the tissues where it's needed. Notice that the rates of VO2 or oxygen consumption are driven by gradients in partial pressure of oxygen. So all of these processes can be simplified as some gradient times some summary parameter. In the case of diffusion at the lung capillary interface, the parameter is pulmonary diffusing capacity or DLO2 and the partial pressure of oxygen gradient is between the alveoli and the capillary. Here's Tim Tam's lung again. Thank you, boy. We'll use the tidal lung as an example to illustrate lung volumes. Remember that in tidal lungs, the air comes in and out of the alveoli like the tide. There are some important lung parameters that you should be aware of. Total lung volume, VL or V capital T, not to be confused with V little t or tidal volume. And tidal volume, as I've told you before, is the volume of a breath. And that can be broken down into VA, alveolar volume, and VD, dead space. You might have seen in your book that VD can be broken down into anatomical dead space and physiological dead space. 
but we're mainly going to focus on anatomical dead space, and the majority of that is the volume of the trachea. These are the portions of the volumes that do not exchange gas. Just FYI, physiological dead space is the volume of alveoli that are not undergoing gas exchange. And that can happen for a variety of reasons, such as insufficient ventilation perfusion, or just not using that portion of the lung. Here is the tracheal volume, the dead space. That's this nice, beautiful trachea right here. There are also a bunch of smaller airways too, but we're not going to worry about that too much. You should realize, however, that the mammalian lung is really intricate and it branches and branches until it reaches the alveoli. Each alveoli is surrounded by a web of capillaries to pick up that oxygen. There are a lot of alveoli in mammals, for example in humans, about 480 million. Just to simplify the alveolar volume, we're going to represent it on the lungs like this. You can also see his diaphragm. It's muscular, and during locomotion, a lot of mammals couple their gait with breathing cycles to increase respiration during exercise. And his liver is behind that. This is his heart, and of course the lungs surround the heart. VA is the alveolar volume. This here is VD, or dead space volume. So you can see that the total amount of one breath is just VA plus VD or VT. So what happens when Tim Tam takes a breath? Air comes in at a partial pressure of O2 of 21.2 kilopascals for fresh air at sea level, and it's going to come in and swirl in each alveoli, where some of the oxygen is going to diffuse into the blood lowering the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli. PaO2 is typically 13.8 kilopascals in most tidal lungs. When Tim Tam expires, the partial pressure of expired air, PO2 expired, is going to be a mix of the dead space air, which has not exchanged any of its oxygen, and the alveolar air, which is at lower PO2. And that's what I want you to remember for later. More about lung volumes. VD plus VA add together to give us tidal volume, or the volume of one breath. VT, in turn, times the breath rate gives us respiratory minute volume, or the volume of air breathed per minute. It's a good time to pause for a moment to emphasize that breathing is always discontinuous. Well, most of the time. Animals take discrete breaths, and there's a certain volume that animals can take in and at a certain frequency. So even if the flow over the lungs or gills is one way or seemingly continuous, all animals have a breath rate and generally take breaths, except maybe ram ventilators. Now let's turn to the question, how to model VO2, or oxygen consumption? Well, logically, it must relate to what we breathe in minus what we breathe out. So if we know that fresh air is at 21.1 kilopascals, and we can solve for this, then this difference between what goes in and what comes out must relate to our oxygen consumption which is VO2. But we do know how to solve for PO2 expired. Remember Tim Tam's lung? So expired air is a mix of fresh air in the dead space plus alveolar air or consumed air. And the PO2 expired is just the partial pressure of oxygen of the fresh air plus the partial pressure of the alveolar air. So that's what the partial pressures are going to be, but how much of each? Remember the size of Tim Tam's breath is VT, or tidal volume. The dead space volume is VD, and the alveolar volume is VA. The air that's going in is 
PO2 of the fresh air, and that's at 21.1 kilopascals. It stays at 21.1 in the dead space because no exchange is happening, whereas in the alveoli, it's at 13.8 kilopascals for most tidal lungs. So that just means that this equation becomes populated by these PO2s and these volumes. And that's it. We said that VO2 or V.02 is related to the partial pressure of oxygen of inspired air minus the partial pressure of oxygen of the expired air. And now we have this. This is the oxygen gradient divided by the total pressure or barometric pressure to give us a percent oxygen extraction. And we have the VE from above. So you can think of this as the volume of air flowing into the lung times the oxygen extraction, which will give us oxygen consumption or VO2. At sea level, the partial pressure of oxygen is 21.1 kPa, and the total barometric pressure, or P-tot, is 101 kilopascals. We know a lot now, so let's do the practice problem. When you see the practice problem, are you going to panic? Of course not! You got this! Instead, a better strategy is to try to treat it like a puzzle. And like all good puzzles, the first thing is what are you trying to figure out? So here, this problem's a little bit dry, and I apologize. But if you look down at the bottom of the page, you see that we're driving towards solving for breath rate. And you're starting with a human who has a certain resting metabolic rate. And you start with some lung volumes, okay? So for this person with this RMR of 333 kilojoules per hour, basically, we're trying to figure out how many breaths per minute does this person have to take in order to meet its RMR. Make sense? Okay, so what I want you to do is take a moment to read over this problem and note that I made a few corrections below. Then I want you to pause the video and try the problem for yourself first before you check the answers, okay? So go ahead and get started and calculate the starting volumes. Here are the starting volumes. Tidal volume is 15% of total lung volume, so that means you're going to take 0 0.15 and multiply it by 4,000 mLs. You do the same for dead space, and then, as you know, alveolar volume is just Vt minus Vd. The rate of oxygen consumption is related to the difference between the air we breathe in and the air we breathe out. Remember that intake is going to be at 21.1 kilopascals, the partial pressure of O2 in air. And then we can model the expired air by remembering that the tidal volume, in the tidal volume, not all the air that goes in makes it into the lung. So it's going to be a mix of the air in the dead space and the alveolar volume. And that's what this equation represents. It's actually a really deep equation. After plugging in the values, you can notice that the dead space in this example comprises about 25% and the alveolar volume 75%. So the expired air is a weighted average of these two partial pressures. So it always comes out in between the two, but how much to one side is going to be determined by the relative volumes. Now notice that the metabolic rate is in kilojoules per hour, but we want to work with oxygen consumption. So we're going to use our conversion factor of 20 kilojoules per liter of oxygen consumed to get a VO2 value, convert RMR to VO2, of 16.65 liters per hour. And then we want to also get the um, 
per ml per minute conversion. So we multiply by one hour per 60 minutes and 1,000 ml per liter to get 277.5 ml of O2 per minute. So now we have VO2. We have the partial pressure of oxygen in and out, as well as the total pressure. So now we are ready to solve for VE, the rate of flow or the minute respiratory volume. Taking a look at this equation, it's just the rate of oxygen consumption is determined by the rate of flow times the oxygen extraction. And here, this equation is saying that we get 16.65 liters of oxygen from extracting 5% of the flow. And that flow works out to be 307.1 liters of air per hour. Another quick unit conversion. And we get the answer in mLs per minute, which is 5119.178. Sucking in 5 liters of air per minute. Wow, <laughs> sounds like a lot, right? So remember, um, the flow is breath rate times tidal volume. So to solve for breath rate, we take the volume pre breathed per minute divided by the volume breathed per breath. And that works out to be, dun dun dun, 8.53 breaths per minute. From Fick's Law, we know that VO2 is related to DLO2, which is the summary of all the morphological terms, times the PaO2 minus PCO2. So if we plug in all those values, and don't forget to multiply by the mass of the 70 kilogram human because this DLO2 is per kilogram, we get 56.7 milliliters per minute. Okay, so you might have noticed that this value is much less than the required VO2. So no, this lung anatomy would not supply RMR in a human. So now it's time to look at the values that we use and think about it. This DLO2 is an average DLO2 for a typical mammal. So what our result would imply, because this uh, amount of RMR is pretty typical for a human, is that humans are actually more athletic than your average animal, mammal, and that our DLO2, if you could find a better value, would actually be a bit higher. Note, during exercise, metabolic rate and tidal volume or breath rate increase, or both, and we can model those respiratory parameters. Also, Modeling gills is analogous, but you just have to use FO2 versions of the equations instead of PO2. That's because we need to use Henry's law, FO2 equals PO2 times alpha, the solubility coefficient of water, of oxygen in water, to take account of dissolved oxygen. This will depend on temperature and salinity. Please use your handy dandy handout. It's got lots of super useful info, such as unit conversions. And here's the in water version of what we were just modeling. VO2 equals VE times the gradient of FO2 inspired minus FO2 expired. Obtain FO2 in water from Henry's law. And you can look up values for alpha, the oxygen solubility coefficient in the book. But what is FO2? It comes from chemistry. Remember the gas laws? FO2 is the molar fraction of a gas. Remember that gases are molecules occupying a volume. So the pressure that oxygen exerts in a mixture of gases, for example air, is going to be related to the molar fraction or percent of oxygen in that mix of gases. The partial pressure of a gas, for example O2, is the fraction of that gas times the atmospheric pressure. All of the gases in air are bouncing around and the percent of the pressure of each type of molecule depends on the fraction of that molecule in the air. <laughs> 
which is a mix of gases. Air is mostly nitrogen with some oxygen and a little bit of carbon dioxide. And the total pressure is the sum of all of the partial pressures of the gases. The PO2 is about 21.1 kilopascals at sea level, whereas the total pressure is about 101 kilopascals. Circling back to the rate of diffusion, the rate is directly proportional to the diffusion constant, a material property of the media, air or water, and the material properties of the respiratory membrane, as well as directly proportional to surface area of the lung or the gill, proportional also to the gradient in partial pressure, here alveolar versus capillary, and inversely proportional to the diffusion distance, here the transalveolar thickness. And you can look these up in table 13-6. It's interesting to note that these three parameters here are anatomical. That is, they're structural and not easy to change. It's convenient to gather all these parameters into a summary parameter and call it pulmonary diffusing capacity or DLO2 or PDCO2. And since it's anatomy, it can be measured and we can find values of DLO2 for different kinds of animals. So then VO2 becomes DLO2 times the PO2 gradient, which is the driving force of diffusion. We can find measured values for DLO2 and multiply it by this gradient, PaO2 minus PCO2, which is remarkably conserved at 2.7 kilopascals for most vertebrates, withers page 629. And then we can compare it to the VO2 required by our DMR or RMR to ask, for example, is your VO2 at RMR or DMR able to be supplied by the design of this type of lung times the typical alveolar capillary PO2 gradient. It's very rough, but it's kind of a back of the envelope check to see if our metabolic rate model is roughly within the ballpark of our measured lung volumes. Does the VO2 specified by our metabolic rate match what our lungs can deliver? That's another way to think about it. Just a reminder that surface area has evolved across the lungs of vertebrates from low metabolic rate amphibians with simple lungs that are basically just a sac to the very high metabolic rate mammals with very complex lungs with millions of alveoli. This is part of what DLO2 captures, that variation in surface area. We can apply the same design strategy to the gill, which is completely analogous once we convert to FO2 using Henry's law. Remember that the FO2 gradient or the delta is just the difference between the two FO2 values, which can then be plugged back into fixed law for gill breathers. In the fish gill design, we can solve for the surface area required. I will warn you though that there is a nasty unit conversion, but that's about it. It's no more complicated than that. Just relax, you got this. You understand what's going on. You just have to keep track of the units. Finally, how do we increase oxygen delivery? Well, from personal experience, we all know that we can take bigger breaths, <laughs> increasing VT, which is gonna result in more of your alveoli being expanded. And we can take more breaths, increasing our breath rate, or we can do both. Basically, increasing VT and BR contribute to increasing respiratory minute volume, so there's just more flow. And increasing VT means increasing VA because the dead space, the trachea, remains the same. 
So if you notice, what happens here is that the proportion of the breath that goes into the alveoli increases. So that's going to mean more opportunity for oxygen to absorb and have an impact on the PO2 expired. Both of these parameters go into the equation for VO2. So you can see how this is going to increase oxygen delivery. Pretty cool, huh? So you can figure out how your animal can increase its oxygen delivery. And you all have a lot of really cool animals. So have a lot of fun trying to figure this out. See you next time.